I'm glad you're here this morning because we're going to talk about incredible heroes. In fact, the Bible is full of stories about incredible heroes. People like Noah, who built an ark and not only saved his family from the flood that destroyed the world, but also two of each animal and seven of all the clean animals, which would be used as a sacrifice to God and for food after the flood. And people like Moses, who delivered the children of Israel from the bondage of slavery and led them to the promised land, who also wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, which is known as the Pentateuch, and within it is the Mosaic Law. Also people like David, who was a man after God's own heart, and who established Israel as the dominant world power at that time, and to whom God promised that one of his descendants would sit upon his throne, ruling over an everlasting kingdom. Now we know that that's a messianic prophecy and it's referring to Jesus Christ, but the reason that promise was given to David is because he was an incredible hero. Also people like Elijah, who was a mighty, mighty prophet of God, and who performed many miracles and signs, which you're familiar with if you grew up going to Sunday school. But today we're living in a society where most of us haven't grown up in Sunday school. So let me do a little informal poll. How many of you grew up going to Sunday school? All right. How many of you didn't grow up going to Sunday school? So maybe 60, 40. Well, you know, that's where we're at in this society. In fact, let me just explain something to you. We're facing things that no generation has ever faced before here in America. And let me explain what I mean by that. This is the first generation where the majority of children are growing up in homes where their parents and both set of grandparents never attended church. Yeah. Always before this generation, the majority of children grew up in a home where either the parents went to church or one set of their grandparents went to church. But that's no longer the case. So we have to present things a little bit differently. And that's the only reason I was asking. Now I could go on and on listing different people who were incredible heroes. People like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. People like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. People like John the Baptist. Paul and Peter. But in this series, we're going to focus on just one incredible hero, and that's Joseph. You see, Joseph had a lot of horrible things happen to him throughout his life, yet he continued to do what was right, not only in God's eyes, but also in man's eyes. And as a result of that, he not only rose to a, to a position of power and prestige, but he also saved hundreds of thousands of people from starvation. Now, the truth is, we live in a very wicked, sinful world, which means that we're going to experience difficult situations just like Joseph did. But we can learn from Joseph's experience and apply the very same principles that he did, and we'll get similar results. Now, we won't get the same results as him, but we'll get similar results on a much smaller scale. So this morning we're going to start a study on the life of Joseph. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start reading verses 1 and 2. This is where the story of Joseph begins. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father an evil report about them. Now I want you to notice that the story of Joseph begins when he was 17 years old. So at 17, he was already a worker. He was working in the fields as a shepherd. And his flock grazed and watered in the very same vicinity as four of his half-brothers, the sons of Bilhah, in Zilpah. So we're talking about Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Now remember, Bilhah and Zilpah were concubines. They weren't legitimate wives. So jo Joseph, by virtue of his birth, held a higher position of authority and status. In other words, by virtue of his mother and who his mother was. And that's why Jacob would have had him working alongside of them rather than alongside the sons of Leah. In fact, Joseph was being prepped for his future role in a leadership position. And the pecking order would have been quite clear. Everyone would have understood it, especially in that culture. You see, the sons of concubines were subservient to the sons of the legitimate wives. Now, look back at verse number 2, and I want you to notice what Joseph was doing. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father an evil report about them. 
So Joseph was reporting back to Jacob and updating him on what was happening in the fields. And it wasn't good. He had to give Jacob an evil report on four of his half-brothers. Now, some people read this and they automatically think that Joseph was being a tattletale. But he wasn't. His obligation as a keeper of his father's flocks was to keep him, his father informed on the condition of his flocks and to the situation in the fields. And the reason this is mentioned in the story is to let us know that Joseph, at the age of 17, was already a man of integrity. He also was very responsible and he had a great work ethic. He took his job very seriously, even if it meant that he had to be a whistleblower on his half-brothers. Which brings us to verse 3. Notice what it says. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than his other children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, I want you to underline the word loved. Loved is translated from the Hebrew word ahab and in this context it means to favor. So notice what verse number 3 is saying. Now, Jacob favored Joseph more than any of his other children. Now, let's find out why he favored him. Look at verse number 3 again, and I want you to notice the phrase, son of his old age. It says, now Jacob favored Joseph more than his other children because, see that word because? Now we're going to find out why he favored Joseph more than his other children. It says he favored Joseph more than his other children because he was the son of his old age. Now, when you read this verse, it seems to imply that Jacob was much older when he had Joseph than he was when he had Reuben, his firstborn son. Am I right? Yeah. In fact, most Christians believe that Reuben was much older than Joseph, not because of what the Bible says, but because we live in a monogamous society. Think about it. When we hear that a family has 11 children, we just naturally assume that there is a huge age difference between the oldest child and the youngest child, right? Don't you naturally assume that? Yeah. So we tend to think that Reuben must have been 20 to 25 years older than Joseph. So we conclude that Jacob must have been an old man when Joseph was born. But people, that's not true. That's not true at all. The truth is, Reuben, who was the first child, the firstborn son, had just turned six years old when Joseph was born. That's right. Jacob had 11 sons within a six-year period from four different women. Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah. So Jacob was not an old man when Joseph was born. In fact, that's not what verse number three is saying. You just thought it was saying that. Now, let me explain how we know that Reuben was only six years old when Joseph was born. If you remember, Jacob worked for Laban for seven years in order to earn the right to marry Rachel. But on his wedding night, Laban pulled a fast one on him. Laban sent Leah into the bridal chamber instead of Rachel. And Jacob didn't realize it was Leah until the very next morning after he had already slept with her. After he had already had sexual intercourse with her. I know what most of you are thinking. How would he not recognize that? We need to understand that the bridal week started in the evening. And you'd have a big feast. And they would serve wine. And I'm sure they got Jacob tipsy. But not only that, the bridal chamber didn't have any lights inside. People, there was no electricity back then. You had these little bitty lamps. But they made sure the bridal chamber didn't have that. That was for the modesty of the women. So when Leah went in there, she would have been wearing a veil with this robe that didn't accent anything. So when she was in there with the veil and there was no light, he's a little bit tipsy. He had no idea it wasn't Rachel until the next morning. He opens up the tent door, maybe to go get some water so they can brush their teeth, they can wash their face. He looks back at his love and it's Leah. And he's livid. When he found out it was Leah... Instead of Rachel, he was mad and he went and confronted Laban. And Laban didn't apologize. Laban said, well, I'm sorry, but our culture dictates that the youngest can't get married until the oldest is married. But, but, if you want to marry Rachel, fulfill the bridal week and I'll give you Rachel. Rachel but you'll have to work for me another seven years. And Jacob agreed to it. So at the end of the bridal week, Rachel became Jacob's wife. 
So within a one week period, Jacob was married to two women, Rachel and Leah. Now, let me say that again. Within a one week period, Jacob was now married to two women, Leah and Rachel. But he had to work another seven years for Laban. Now, Leah was fertile myrtle. She got pregnant almost immediately, probably sometime during that bridal week. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, Reuben, sometime in the first year of their marriage, 40 weeks later. You see, we always think that, well, you're pregnant for nine months. No, 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 no. You're pregnant for 40 weeks. Because you measure it from the time of conception. Life begins at conception. And it takes 40 weeks for the child to be to that age where average it's going to be delivered. Now, why do we say nine months? Because 40 weeks is 10 months. We say nine months because we count from when the woman realizes she's pregnant. And from the time she realizes she's pregnant, which is a month later, it's nine months. Right? So if Leah got pregnant during the bridal week, it's going to be 40 weeks, which is 10 months. All right? So she gives birth to Reuben, her firstborn son, sometime at the end of the first year that he has to work for Laban. Rachel, on the other hand, she has a very difficult time getting pregnant, but eventually she did. And she gave birth to her first child right before Jacob finished his seven-year obligation to Laban. Look at Genesis chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Soon after Rachel had given birth to Joseph. So this is after Joseph was born. Not a long time after it, but a short time. Notice it says soon after. Soon after Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Please release me so I can go home to my own country. Let me take my wives and children, for I have earned them by serving you. This is written in past tense. In other words, soon after Joseph was born, Jacob had fulfilled his obligation to Laban. So just a short time after, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, no longer than a month, after Joseph was born, he's fulfilled his obligation to Laban. He says, please release me. I have fulfilled my job. So we know when Joseph was born. Joseph was born right before He did that, right? So let's keep reading. And let me be on my way. You certainly know how hard I have worked for you. In other words, I fulfilled my part of the bargain. So Joseph was born right before Jacob fulfilled his obligation to Laban, which means right before the seven-year period ended. Now, let's look at this on the whiteboard because you guys need to put this together to understand what's taking place. This is a timeline. goes on out here. Esau and Jacob get into it. You know the story. Jacob stole the blessing supposedly from Esau. Esau gets mad. He says, I'm going to kill you. Well, mom and dad, Isaac and Rebecca, they know that Esau's kind of out of control. He has a temper. He's a man's man. And if he says he's going to kill Jacob, he's going to kill Jacob. So what are they telling him to do? You need to go to my relatives till he calms down. All right? So they send him off to, uh, to Rebecca's relatives. So he goes to Laban. And when he meets Laban, he sees this good-looking woman. And this good-looking woman is Rachel. The Bible says she was beautiful in her face, and she had a shapely figure. Even the Bible notices those things. So he wanted her. So he said, Laban, I want Rachel, your daughter. And he says, you're going to have to work for me for seven years. So he works for seven years for Rachel. And then they have the wedding feast. And if you know anything about the Jewish customs, he went in the evening time and he went to go get his bride, but she has on a veil. Yeah. He doesn't know who it is. And they have this feast. And then he goes into the bridal chamber. He has sexual intercourse. But the next morning, the light comes up. He opens up the tent door. It's Leah. And he's mad. So he confronts Laban. And he says, You promised me to give me Rachel. And he says, the custom doesn't dictate that. The custom dictates that the youngest one can't get married until the oldest one is married. If you want her, fulfill the bridal week. How long is the bridal week? A week. Seven days. So fulfill this seven days. And then I'll give you Rachel. So at the end of seven days, he's married to two women. Now, immediately, Leah is pregnant. So 40 weeks out, 
She has Reuben. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Rachel is upset because she's been sleeping him for two, 10 months and she's not pregnant. So she goes to Jacob and she says, you need to give me a child. And Jacob says, I'm not, or uh, yeah, Jacob says, I'm not God. I can't do that. And by the way, it's not my fault. Notice that Leah is pregnant. If there's a problem, it's not me. So is Rachel, what does she do? She says, well, take my handmaiden, Bilhah, and have children for me. So Bilhah becomes a concubine, a secondary wife. And so Jacob starts sleeping with Bilhah because you want sons. 97% of the population's in agriculture. You need sons in order to be successful, in order to protect the family. And so he and his duty starts having sex with three women now. Well, Leah continues to have children, but she gets to the point, maybe her prolactin levels are too high because she's nursing all of these children. But for some reason, she stops having children. So she says, take Zilpah and start having children with her for me. And so there's this competition going. So all of these children, Simeon, Levi, and all of these kids start coming in until we get to the almost the seven years. And that six-year period, guess what? Rachel finally gets pregnant. Ah, what she was praying for. And how long does it take? 40 weeks. 40 weeks is 10 months. So shortly before he fulfills his seven years, Joseph is born. Now, Reuben wasn't born for 10 months, almost where you started the second year, he's born before the seventh. So, let me ask you a question. What was the age difference between Reuben the firstborn and Joseph? About six years. Yeah. Reuben wasn't born until it was almost the first year was over. So, almost the second year. Joseph was born almost to the seventh. So there's only a six-year difference. So when Joseph was 17, Reuben was only 23. So Jacob wasn't much older when he had Joseph than he was when he had Reuben. Now, Benjamin's another story. He wasn't born until they were in Canaan. They'd been there quite a while. So in all probability, he probably wasn't born until 15 years after Joseph. So Benjamin truly was the baby of the family. He was a son of Jacob's old age, but not Joseph. So why does verse number 3 say that Joseph was the son of Jacob's old age? Why does it say that? It doesn't say that. Not if you translate it literally. You see, if you translate verse number 3 literally, it says a son of old age was he to him. That's a literal translation. So the reason Jacob favored Joseph was because he was a son of old age. Now the phrase son of old age is a Hebraism. In other words, it was a common figure of speech that the Jews used in that time period. And it simply meant that a young person was wise beyond their years. In other words, he had the wisdom of an old man in a young man's body. And that's what the phrase son of old age means. It means that Joseph was wise beyond his years. At 17, he had the wisdom of men who were three and four times older than him. Three or four times his age. And that's why his father favored him. Not because he was the baby. He wasn't the baby. Benjamin was the baby. And not because Jacob was old when Joseph was born. He wasn't. At least he wasn't much older when he had Joseph than he was when he had Reuben. His firstborn. So again, why did Jacob favor Joseph? He favored him because he was wise beyond his years. At 17, he had more wisdom than men twice his age. He had the wisdom of men three and four times his age. And that's what son of old age means. So what did his father do? Well, he gave him a coat of many colors. Look at verse number three. Now, Israel favored Joseph more than all his children because, he's going to tell us why, a son of old age was he to him. In other words, he was wise. He was more wise than all the other people around him. In fact, he was wise as men that were three and four times his age. Therefore, it goes on. 
and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, people, this was a very special coat. In fact, this type of coat was a status symbol. Only the leader of the family clan could wear a robe like this robe. And the firstborn son was also given a coat like this, but not until his father decided to recognize him as being worthy of the birthright. So by giving Joseph this coat, it signified that Joseph was being given the privileged position of preeminence over his brothers in the administrative affairs of the family. In other words, it signified that Jacob was designating Joseph to be the recipient of the birthright, which meant that he would become the leader of the family clan when Jacob died. So now we know who Jacob chose to inherit the birthright. In fact, by giving him the coat of many colors, he was making it known publicly. Everyone knew who was going to receive the birthright. It was going to be Joseph. That's what the coat of many colors signified. So turn to verse number four. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably unto him. In other words, once Joseph was chosen to receive the birthright, his brothers hated him. Reuben hated him because he was the firstborn son. So he thought he should have received the birthright. But remember, Reuben forfeited his right to the birthright when he slept with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Rachel's handmaid. That automatically showed that he was not worthy to receive it. Simeon was next in line to receive the birthright, but because of what he and Levi had done at Shechem, they definitely didn't deserve it, but in their mind what they did was justified, so they felt like they were being passed over, so they hated Joseph for being chosen to receive the birthright instead of them. How many of you remember what happened at Shechem? They deceived all the men of Shechem into getting circumcised, and on the second day, the beginning of the third day, when they were too sore to even move, Simeon and Levi went into the village and killed every man with the sword. Yeah. And Jacob said, I can't put one of you in charge. Man, our whole family clan will be nothing but a fighting tribe. I can't do that. Issachar and Zebulun were hard workers, but let's be honest, they weren't very bright. Just study when he gives the blessings to each one of his children. He gives one blessing. It's called the blessing. And then he blesses all of the other children. That's the way the Jews did it back then. But when he gives his blessing, it's like, you're hard workers, but you're not too bright. Oh, yeah. But let's be honest. None of us are ever going to admit that we barely made it through school, right? Yeah, we don't admit that. And they weren't going to admit that. So they resented Joseph. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher... They were the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. So as the sons of concubines, they didn't have a chance of receiving the birthright, but they were still older, and they resented the fact that their baby brother was the one that was going to receive it. Yeah. So basically, all of Joseph's brothers resented him for being chosen to receive the birthright. And verse number 4 says, they couldn't speak peaceably unto him. Look at verse number 4 again, and I want you to underline that word peaceably, because the majority of you don't even know what that means. Notice what it says. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now that doesn't mean what you think it does. You see, the word peaceably is translated from the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom, of course, means peace. But here's what you don't know. That's the way the Jews greeted each other, and they still do that today. In fact... If you travel over to Israel and you see someone and you want to say hi because we're from the south. You you go up north and people just ignore each other. But in the south, we're friendly. You're driving down the road and you're just waving at everyone even if you don't know them. Right? You make eye contact, what are you supposed to say? Hello. Yeah. Now, if you go to Israel because you're from the south and you see a Jew walking towards you and you make eye contact, what are you going to say? You're going to say hello, but they don't know what that means. So what do you say? What are you supposed to say? You're supposed to say shalom. It means peace, but it's their way of saying hi. So if you're in Israel and you want to say hi to someone, you say shalom. And they respond shalom back to you. If you want to know how they're doing, you say mashlamek. Mashlamek. Or if they're a male, it's mashlamek. And I can't really do the k part. But actually what it means, ma's what? Shalom is peace. And so what you're asking is what's your peace? But that's the way they say how are you doing? You say, what's your peace? Mashlamek. You kind of 
garble it all together. And then what do they respond? They say, tov tada. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. This was the way they greeted each other in Jacob's day, in Joseph's day. So when it says they could not speak peaceably unto him, it means that when he walked up and said shalom, they would not respond shalom. Yeah. So what verse number four is saying is that they wouldn't even acknowledge Joseph when he came around. They acted like he didn't exist. He walked up to his brothers and he said shalom, and they just acted like he wasn't even there. Yeah. They simply ignored him. But it got even worse. Look at verses 5 through 11. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. If you thought it was bad, it's getting really to get real bad. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. Indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept this matter in mind. Now, does anyone know why Joseph received these dreams from God? Well, these dreams were given as divine confirmation that he was the right person to receive the birthright. So naturally, Joseph shared the dreams with his family because in his mind, this was confirmation. Confirmation from God that he was supposed to be the one that received the birthright. Hey, listen to me. Dad didn't make a mistake. He said that I'm going to receive the birthright. I've got the coat of many colors. But God has confirmed it with the dream. But it only antagonized them even more. Now, both dreams were symbolic and pretty easy to interpret. In fact, Joseph's fathers and brothers knew exactly what the dreams meant. In the first dream, the sheaves represented the sons of Jacob. When all of the sheaves bowed down before Joseph's sheaf, it meant that one day, all of Joseph's brothers would humble themselves and bow before him. That was pretty easy to interpret. Joseph would take Jacob's place when he died as the leader of the family clan, and he would be the one that was in charge. In the second dream, the stars represented Joseph's brothers, the sun represented Jacob, and the moon represented not only Rachel, but also his three other wives, the other wife and the two concubines. Now, what this meant is that Joseph's whole family would bow before him one day. Now, Jacob was irritated by the second dream. And he rebuked Joseph. You wanna know why? Well, I'll tell you why. The father was supposed to designate who would receive the birthright before he died. And as I've said, it was supposed to go to the firstborn unless he proved himself to be unworthy of it. And in that case, the father could select any one of his other male children. He did not have to go in line. So if the firstborn proved himself to be unworthy, then the father would take a step back and he would just watch his other sons and then he would choose which one of those he thought had the most wisdom in order to be the leader of the family clan. But the son did not actually receive the birthright. He was just designated to receive it. He didn't actually receive it until the father died. So when Jacob heard the dream... He thought that the power of the birthright was starting to go to Joseph's head. Because according to the dream, even Jacob, while he was still alive, would humble himself and bow before Joseph. The whole family would. So he rebuked Joseph. He went to him and he said, wait a minute. I'm still alive. and You want to be the leader of the family clan? Now think about this. This would be like you put your living trust together, you bring your children together, and you say, I just want you to know up front, this is the way we're going to divide the inheritance. It's all in the living trust. And one of your kids says, well, I want my part now. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not even dead yet. And you want it now? See, that's what Jacob thought with Joseph was, I'm not even dead yet, and you want to be the leader of the family? 
So he rebuked him. But he didn't dismiss the dream. Look at the last part of verse 11. And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Jacob never forgot about it. Jacob always remembered it. So let me ask you a question. Should Joseph have kept his mouth shut? Should he have kept his mouth shut? What do you think? Was it foolish to share his dreams with his family? Well, the answer is no. And let me explain why. Had Joseph not told his family about the dreams, then they wouldn't have had any impact on them when those dreams came to pass. But by telling his family about the dreams, God's providence and power were glorified when they did come to pass, when they did come true. So even though it caused him heartache and grief, he did the right thing in sharing them. Which tells us that sometimes, even when we do the right thing, it still rises up and bites us in the butt. But it's still the right thing to do. And God will bless us for doing this. Now, this is going to become a recurring pattern in Joseph's life. Joseph does the right thing, and it bites him in the butt. Joseph does the right thing, and it bites him in the butt. Joseph does the right thing, and it bites him in the butt. But I want you to think about this. It doesn't stop him from doing the right thing. And that's what separates Joseph from all of us. Because when we do the right thing and it bites us in the butt, what do we say? Well, I'm not going to do that again. I did the right thing and look where it got me. I won't do that again. What are you actually saying? You're actually saying that you won't do what's right. You know what's interesting? You would have thought Joseph learned something. See, most of you are thinking that. Well, he should have learned his lesson. He just should have kept his mouth. No, no, no. He was going to do the right thing whether it got him in trouble or not. And that's one of the reasons God can't use us. Because when we do the right thing, many times it bites us in the butt. But God sees what the end result will do. And he says, keep on doing the right thing. And you go, well, I'm not going to do that again, God. And God says, if you don't keep doing the right thing, I can't bless you. That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. Now, we all know the rest of the story. Jacob sent Joseph out to check on his brothers. And when his brothers saw him coming from a distance, they made plans to murder him. Look at verses 18 through 20. We're still in chapter 37. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. How could they recognize him? He had the robe. Yeah. There he is. Now notice, as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Yeah, they're mocking him. Come on, let's kill him and throw him to one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But Reuben came to his rescue. And he convinced them not to murder him in cold blood. Instead, to throw him into a cistern and just let him starve to death. And then he planned on coming back to rescue him. Look at verses 21 and 22. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty sister here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without us having to lay a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So Reuben's not a bad guy. Reuben's got a good heart. The problem is Reuben wasn't a leader. Reuben should have taken control of the situation. Boys, 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 listen to me. I'm the firstborn. We're not going to do that. But no, 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 no. He's a follower. So he gives in to them, but he still knows what's right. And his thought is, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to rescue him when they've all left. Well, Reuben leaves because he's hoping everyone else will leave so he can come back. Well, when he left, a, a caravan of traders, Ishmaelites, came by. And Judah suggested that they sell Joseph to them as a slave. And that's what they did. Now, I've got a lot of things to cover in the end, so I'm not going to read this passage of Scripture. Let me give it to you. This is verses 23 through 34. You can go home and read it. I'm going to read just the first verse of it, but it's the whole story of them selling them to the Ishmaelites. Notice what it says. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him in the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, and it goes on and says that. And then this Ishmaelite caravan comes along. Judah says, why should we kill him when we can make money from him? And they sell it. All right? But my thought is, wow. These are the people that God used to build a nation. 
A nation that would bring forth the Messiah, the seed of the woman. You know what's interesting about God? God does not hide his skeletons in the closet. He just puts it all out there for us to see. These are the eponymous leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. What do I mean by eponymous? Everyone knows what an eponym is, right? An eponym is something that's named after a person. I think Tinkiller, there was a ferry. The Tinkillers owned the ferry across the river. So that's called Lake Tinkiller. You know, that's what we do. Well, every one of the 12 tribes is named after one of the 12 sons, except for Joseph. Joseph does not get a tribe because he gets the birthright. So he gets a double portion, so his two sons get it, Manasseh and Ephraim. But anyways, that's another story. Here's what I want you to understand, though, because I want to make some application here. As a parent, how do you raise a child like Joseph, a child of old age? In other words, how do you raise a child wise beyond their years? How do you raise a child that has the wisdom of, of men that are three and four times their age? Well, of course, you have to do what Proverbs 22, 6 says and train up your children the way that they should go. But you have to do something else. You have to instill within them certain core values. In fact, these core values should become your family core values. And you need to instill these family core values within your children. You see, what you want to do, and I want you to take notes. I want you to write this down. It's not going to come up on the screen. What you want to do is you want to raise your children to have the wisdom of an old person. Let me say that again. You want to raise your children to have the values of an old person. Now, why do you want them to have the values of an old person? Because an old person knows what's really important in life. When you're young, what you think is important is not. I'm 58 years old. 12 more years, I'll be 70. 22 more years, I'll be 80. God promises three score and 10. If by strength you live to be 80. If I have great genetics, I might make it to 90. But I doubt it. I don't take care of myself. But anyways. And please don't send me an email about taking care of myself. Anyways. <laughs> I get them all the time. I'll do it when I want to do it. But anyways. At my age, I know what's really important in life. It's not money. It's relationships. It's God. Now, not every old person is wise. I go to see people sometimes on their deathbed, and they're still not prepared to meet Jesus. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. But if you're wise and you're an older person, you realize what's important. So you want to raise your children to have the values of an old person. If you raise your children to have the values of an old person, they will be as wise as people three to four times their age, as people that are in their 70s and 80s. Yeah. That's what Joseph had. He had the wisdom. He was a son of old age, was he to him. He had the wisdom of men three and, three and four times his age. He knew what was really important in life. So here are the family values that you need to put, teach your children. Number one, there's going to be seven of them. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. Some of you are bitter at God because you think that he's a genie and he's supposed to give you everything you want and he didn't come through and this is what he didn't do. I got news for you. You are not the protagonist of the story. God is. God does not exist to answer every one of your prayers. God does not exist to serve you. You exist to serve God. So if you didn't get your way, grow up. Good Lord. Life is not about you. And hopefully you'll be wise enough one day when you hit 70 or 80 and you're going to try and tell your children and your grandchildren, let me tell you what life is about. Life is about God, family. I'm not going to tell you the third one. In our family, it's education, but that's up to you. Number two, what does it matter if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? People, salvation is more important than anything. That's what Matthew 16, 26 says. When you're young, uh-uh, uh-uh. Man, you want to gain the whole world. You want to be important, you want to be rich, you want to be famous, you want to have money. 
And what you don't realize is the most important thing is your soul. Number three, the word of God is the standard by which we live. You'll find that in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and James chapter 1, verse 22. Now, people, you need to understand something. We don't conform to the world's standards or to the world's values. We conform to God's standards and to God's values. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me tell you something. I don't give a dang what the world thinks. And if a person hits their 70s and 80s, and they haven't reached this conclusion that we don't live by the world's standards and the world's values, they're not very wise. Because they're getting ready to meet God and they're not prepared. You want your children to have this value that we live by the word of God and not by the world, not by their standards, not by their values. Number four, you should know this one. This should be memorized. We're a family. And nothing is more important than family. We work together. We help each other. We make personal sacrifices for the good of the family. Let me tell you, that's number two on the list. You get to your deathbed, and let me tell you something. The thing that you realize is you'd sacrifice all of your money and even your health if your children are saved and living for the Lord. If your children are following the word of God, and they're successful because they're following those biblical principles. Number five, life is not measured by how much you own. Oh, good gosh, I wish people understood this. In other words, this is not how you measure success. In fact, spiritual things are much more important than physical things. Luke chapter 12, verse number 15 says, Life does not consist of the, materi- the, of the, life does not consist of the abundance of the material things that we possess. So that's how we measure success. When you get to the end of your life and all of the land and and, and the things that you own and all of the toys that you own and all of those things, that shows you were successful. And yet the Bible says if you die and you not live for the Lord, you were a fool. Because you traded just a brief moment in time. Life is but a vapor for all eternity. People, life is not measured by how much you own. Number six. We're not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. It's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. There's a reason I preach because I know there's an eternity, I know there's a God, and I know the only way to reach that God and have grace and not judgment is to receive his son Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior. And I want my kids to know that. And last but not least, number seven. All work is honorable as long as it's not illegal or immoral. You ever hear your child say, well, I won't do that. You make sure that's exactly what they do until you tell them they can't do it anymore. I learned at a young age, don't say in front of my mom and dad, I wouldn't do something because that's the very thing they were going to make me do. But I I appreciate that because here's what they taught me. All work, doesn't matter what you do. All work is honorable as long as it's not illegal or immoral. And this generation doesn't have that. Now again, You want to raise your children with these values because these are the values of an old person. And if you want to raise your children to be like Joseph, if you want them to do something great with their life, then you need to not only train them in the way that they should go, but you need to instill these values within them because these are the values of an old person. But they're the values of someone who's lived a life and at the end of their life they realize what's important and what's not important.